Welcome back. So this week we are going to be talking about historical linguistics and language change. And we're going to start by focusing on language change in a broad way and also with um, a little bit of focus on English and some of the history of English. Um, this is just a very brief overview, but something that um, can help elucidate some of the aspects of English that maybe seem a little bit confusing when we think about what English is today, but can kind of show that there is a lot more pattern to what English has become over time when we consider what English used to be as Old English. So when we think about language change, language change is something that is a constant of language. We talked about this at the very beginning of the semester, that all languages are always changing. This is something that is constantly happening. And just as with variation that we saw in the last unit, any aspect of language can change over time as well. So things like sounds, meanings, structures, conventions, all of these things can change over a period of historical time in the same way that we see differences in the moment with things like regional variation and social variation. Languages change for a lot of other reasons as well. Um, so this is just a small sample of them, but some of them include things like languages encountering and influencing one another. So if they have a lot of time in contact with each other, they will likely influence each other in various levels of structure. Um, this also includes things like borrowings of languages as well. We tend to regularize um, irregular paradigms and patterns. So this can happen between first or second language learners. So over time, we've noticed that even though historically we had different ways of doing something like the past tense, for instance, over time, more and more of our verbs are becoming more regularized with that ED ending. And we're losing some of those other past tense verbs that had the internal past tense. Um, so we can see how these patterns are sort of regularizing and changing over time as well. We also, as we've seen throughout the semester, invent new words or we stop using old ones. So slang can come into the language and then over time it'll become just part of the language itself and we don't really think of it as slang anymore because it's gained such widespread usage. We stop using things that are no longer relevant. So things like thee and thy are words that we don't really use anymore. Uh, Fortnite is not a very common word that we use to refer to time. But there's other ones that we bring in based on things like technology and invention or just simply having different things that are relevant to us in our world in that moment. <clears throat> we also see that with the creation of dialects, this can also lead to different kinds of changes. So as speakers separate into different subgroups and grow apart, their variation is going to increase as well. The way that the language changes might be different for each individual group of people based on what's important to those subgroups and to those language communities. So if we look a little bit at some of the patterns in Old English, Old English doesn't look anything like what you might think of English as today. Our language looks vastly different now than what it did during the Old English period. And this has happened in a lot of different ways. So one of them is just our general word order. So in Old English, they actually preferred a subject and then object and then verb word order. Um, so verbs would more often come at the end than they would in the middle even though now we have a very strict syntax that puts the subject first and then the verb and then the object in almost all of our cases, we don't always see that in Old English, but there was a little bit more flexibility in Old English. <clears throat> so in a sentence that would, in modern English, be tr translated, then it rained and a flood came there and the winds blew, you can see that then rained it and there came flood and blew winds. We have different orderings for some of those, so then it rained becomes then rained it, um, and so we can see some of the different orders of how things are going in Old English versus how we see them today. Morphology is also a huge, huge change that we've had from Old English to today. So we've talked about morphology, we've talked about syntax, we've talked about how there's not a lot of inflectional morphemes in English right now, but there used to be a lot of them. We used to have cases and different kinds of morphology that was inflectional, that were on things like nouns and adjectives um, in ways that we don't really do any longer. So in just a single word, if we take the word stone, for instance, we had different forms of that word depending on the role that it played in the sentence. So our nominative form, stan, versus plural, stanas. The genitive form or the possessive form, stanes versus stana. Dative, stane versus stanum. So we notice that there's a lot of differences. And only a few of these have really stayed in English. So the nominative singular form is the most common one that we see in most languages uh, in most of our dialects today. So that's the form in most of our words that has sort of stuck around. The plural is sort of taken from that nominative form as well. And we have some 
um, vestiges of that genitive, that possessive marker, that apostrophe S sort of comes from the different case marker that we had, although we apply it in a slightly different way now than we used to. We've also had a lot of changes in sound. That's probably one of the most crucial changes to English or time. Um, so one of the most uh, influential sound changes that have taken place in the history of English is known as the Great Bell Shift. So this was around the time of around 1400 to 1600, including Shakespeare's time. <clears throat> and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but generally the long low vowels became mid vowels, our long mid vowels became high vowels, and then the long high vowels became diphthongs. They couldn't go any higher, so they sort of collapsed and created the diphthongs that we use today. And this occurred during a time when we were standardizing our spelling rules. And so this is part of why our spelling system doesn't make sense with how we pronounce things, because we created our spelling system before a lot of these changes took place. This is why we have a lot of those silent E's at the end, because we used to pronounce those when we had case, and then we got rid of them over time. This is why a lot of our vowels don't seem to match things that we see in the IPA. <clears throat> because we used to have things that were closer to the IPA pronunciations. And then over time, with all those sound changes, our spelling didn't change, but the sounds did. <coughs> and so if we look at the sort of change that took place over this shift, the low vowels that were long, we used to have a distinction between long and short vowels. Now we have more of a tense and lax distinction. Um, but And that is due partly to this change. But an ah, a long ah sound in something like bata, moved up and became bait. The a eh sound in the word beat became beat. The a eh sound in beat, as in the vegetable, became beat, more of an e sound. And then that e sound in vita became bite. So we collapse that into the diphthong. This happened with our back vowels also. So bot became boat, boat became boot, boot became bout. So we have a lot of those changes, and we can look at some other example words as well, where even some of the plurals that we have that were formed internally in Old English <clears throat> that we still retain today, we have different pronunciations for them because of this. So the E in mice became niece goes to mice, and then in mouse, moose goes to mouse. For geese, it was the same kind of thing. Geese became geese, goose became goose. And you can see the spelling representing the previous sounds, how they were. And then you can see our pronunciation today not reflected in the spelling as a result of that. This also happened in some other words that had multiple syllables. So something like break was once brecken, and now it's break. Brocken became broke. Nama became name. So we can see that there were some specific environments where this tended to happen with these different long vowels. And it was conditioned by these particular environments. So long vowels, and then occasionally some vowels that weren't really long vowels, but sounded longer because they were in open syllables. Open syllables being syllables that don't have a consonant after the vowel can lead to some of those changes. So the word C, for instance, is in an open syllable. The word sick is not in an open syllable. It has a consonant after that vowel and therefore wouldn't have undergone a change. And this also was something that some morphemes could also block and created different pronounced sounds in different words that are historically related to each other. So this is where we get differences in something like sign, where it did undergo the change, versus signature, which didn't because it had that uh, sound and those extra morphemes to block it, or divine and divinity, or fool and folly, sane, sanity where all of these are historically related to each other, but those additional morphemes on there helped block the conditions to make that sound change take place. So this is a really important thing that has changed over time, and it's a really important one to pay attention to, especially if you're trying to think about why our spelling system is so different than it used to be, or why our spelling system is so different than our pronunciation. So for non-native speakers, this is a really important thing to think about because it can help you explain why our spelling system doesn't seem to match our pronunciation in the ways that you might expect in other languages. Other things that have happened was affecting different kinds of irregular plurals. So as I mentioned a moment ago, loose and lease became louse and lice, goose and geese became goose and geese, those kinds of things. But then we have other words that don't appear to have gone through this. So why don't we have a plural of moose that would be niece, according if we're going based on the same kind of idea? We would expect something like that, but we don't have anything that, that looks like that. 
And in this case, you can also tell when words entered the language based on what kinds of sound changes have taken place. So in the case of moose, we didn't have moose in England. They only existed in America. So we borrowed this from Ojibwe, and this was long after the Great Vowel Shift had taken place. By the time people started colonizing America, the Great Vowel Shift had already pretty much finished. So they were already pronouncing things with the more modern pronunciations. And then they just conformed the spelling to the sound conventions we had. So that O, O in goose now had an oo sound. So we just spelled it similar because it sounded similar. And so when we see those internal plural changes in things like goose and geese or mouse and mice, these are things that you're only going to find in those old English words that have a Germanic origin. So words that don't follow that pattern <clears throat> have changed in different ways or were borrowed in later on in time. So what I'd like to do is give you an example of what it sounded like in Middle English versus in Early Modern English. So this is a Middle English hymn that I'm going to show you. Um, and you just need to follow along with the audio for this one. Um, so the first half will play the Middle English, and I have the lyrics or the words up for you on the screen. They're a little small and maybe a little hard to read, but can help you kind of follow along with the differences. Um, after a small pause, it'll play the Early Modern ones as well. So this is the hymn. So follow along on the left column first, and that'll be what you're reading there. Um, the earlier modern one is going to be the one that follows, and that would be after the vowel shift. Um, and you'll notice that some of the spellings are different, but they have been cleaned up to be a little bit closer to modern day spellings, um, even though the pronunciations are not necessarily going to match, and the spellings that we saw during that time may not have been exactly the same. Out of your sleep arise and walk, for God man keened no hath it hack, all of a maid without any mack, of all women she beareth the bell no well. And thorough a maid, fire and wees, no man is mad of full great priest, no angelis knelen to man is service, and at this team all this befell no well. No man is brichter than the sun, no man in heaven an he shall won. Blessed be God, this gam is begun, and his murder empress of hell, Noel. That ever was thrall, no is he fray, that ever was small, no great is she, no shall God dame both they and me, unto his bliss if wed o well. No well. No man may to heaven wend, no heaven and earth to him thy bend. He that was foe, no is our friend, this is no nigh that he you tell, no well. No blessed brother grant us grass, Adomes die to say thee fass, and in the court to have a place, that we mo there sing no well. Noel. Out of your sleep arise and wake, for God mankind now hath it take, all of a maid without any make, of all women she beareth the bell, Noel. And through a maid fair and wise, now man is made of full great price, now angels kneelen to man's service, and at this time all this befell, Noel. No man is brighter than the sun, no man in heaven on high shall warn. Blessed be God, this game is begun, and his mother empress of hell, Noel. That ever was thrall, now is he free, that ever was small, now great is she, now shall God deem both thee and me, Unto his bliss, if we do well, Noel. No man may to heaven wend, No heaven and earth to him they bend. He that was foe, now is our friend. This is no nay, that I you tell, Noel. No blessed brother, grant us grace, A dumb's day, to see thy face, And in thy court, to have a place that we mo there sing Noel, Noel.
So between the first one and the second one, you probably noticed quite a few changes. If you didn't have the words to follow along with the Middle English one, it probably would have been hard to really interpret exactly what was being said if you're listening to it, because those vowels were so much different that sometimes words that might sound familiar were actually completely different words in our modern day usage. Um, and there's also some other things that you may have noticed. So the early modern, you probably were able to follow along with and not have to read along the entire time because it sounded much closer to our present day English. There were still some changes and there's still some differences that you may have noticed. And there's even some consonant differences that we won't spend a lot of time on in class, but that were also a part of this. So brichter versus brighter, where we used to have a ch sound in English that we no longer have. Um, was something that we still found in Middle English and had lost by Early Modern English. Um, something like knelen, where we have the kn sound. We used to pronounce those consonant clusters entirely with both sounds. Over time, we've lost that and only pronounce one of those sounds in our present day forms. So you can hear a lot of those changes of what it used to sound like versus what you can expect it to sound like in Early Modern English, so after Shakespeare's time and then moving into a more present day sounding form of English. There's also been a lot of changes in meaning that happen. <clears throat> so we've seen some of the structural changes, we've seen some of the sound changes, but meaning of the words over time does also change as well. So um, when we talked about semantics, we talked about how it's a more stable property of linguistic expression, but that doesn't mean that over time things can't change slowly. We see words change relatively quickly in things like slang, but even for words that aren't slang in usage, over time, words do still change their meaning as the context changes or as the usage changes by who's using what. So this is the meaning changing of certain words, the sort of semantic changes. So in Old English, we had a word hund, hound, and um, doga, which was um, dog. And in that, we had meanings that were slightly different than what we would have today. So if anyone's familiar with German, the word for dog in German is hund. And that is what the word meant in Old English. So hound or hund was all dogs. And then dog was just a specific breed of dog. And this is sort of flipped over time, where now dog is the more general term, and hounds are a certain kind of dog. And so we can see how some of the meanings have sort of flipped over time. In Old English, the word brid for bird, or hool for fowl, um, words that we do still have today, even though the pronunciations are slightly different also had slightly different meanings. So bird was just a young bird, and then fowl was our generic word for birds, even though today, now bird has broadened out to be a general word for any kind of bird. And we refer to fowl basically just as the kind of birds that we would eat. So a more specific change for fowl, a broader change for bird. <clears throat> Sometimes the meanings can be somewhat more subtle and sometimes they can also in some ways retain some of their old meaning but not necessarily in the dominant usage. So the old English word crafty, which even though it looks very different was still pronounced the same relatively. So the word crafty in Old English only had the interpretation of strong or skillful. Today we often use this in a more derogatory way or a more pejorative way. So if someone's crafty they're probably kind of sly or they're doing something that's not exactly on the up and up. You can use it to mean something that's sort of like skillful, but when we think about crafty, we think about like someone doing arts and crafts or someone having a hobby and not something like an ironsmith that would be doing um, very strong, skillful work like it would have been used in the Old English times. One of my favorites, Middle English, the word nice was something that we got from, excuse me, that we got from French. Um, and so during this time, nice didn't mean what we think it means. It only meant foolish. And so we borrowed this from Old French during the time that French was um, sort of dominating England. Um, and that meaning has changed over time, right? It's gotten much nicer. It's a much better meaning. If someone is nice now, most of the time we use that as a compliment. In Middle English, you didn't want to be called nice because that did not mean something positive. That meant something more like foolish or stupid. And to sort of compare that, our Old English word dizzy, again, different pronunciation or different spelling, but similar pronunciation. At the time in Old English, it also meant foolish or stupid. But by the time we got to Middle English, it had started to referring more to our present day understanding of it meaning a sense of vertigo. And with that change, there was now a hole in the language. And that's why we ended up borrowing nice from Old French in order to 
have a meaning for that concept since the other word that we used was no longer referencing that same idea. There is still a little bit of this original meaning left over in some sometimes negative terms, things like dizzy blonde or ditzy blonde, still has that sort of old English meaning and it's never really used as a compliment when it's used. So that gives some ideas of different changes in meaning. Um, if anyone's interested, occasionally we teach the history of English in this um, in at Boise State, um, and we dive much deeper into all of these different aspects of the history of English in that course. Some other things that are really important for language change over time and language change within languages. Um, one really important concept that are very common is something that's known as grammaticalization. This is a very fundamental theory in functional linguistics. This is generally seen as unidirectional, meaning that words will start out as content words, and then over time they'll become used more and more until they become more like function words. So they sort of lose their lexical aspect, they lose their um, main sort of meaning, and start becoming used more as grammatical words. So they're becoming grammatical from these lexical forms. And so the more frequent we use these constructions, the more often we tend to use things. We tend to also shorten them phonetically. So if we use words very frequently, we don't want to have to say these big, long words if we're constantly, constantly using them. And those shorter words tend to have a more grammatical function rather than a lexical meaning. So our most frequent words in English, words like the, be, to, of, and, a, uh, in, that, have, I, Almost all of these are function words, and the couple of verbs that are in there are also sometimes function words in that they're auxiliary verbs for other main verbs. So the reason that these are most common is that we're using them more for grammatical purposes than for lexical purposes. And as some words become more frequent, they're more likely to become shortened over time. So a relatively recent phenomenon, one that's started to happen over the last several decades, is I am going to, being shortened to I'm gonna, and now we also hear people say just I'm a. So it still means I am going to, but we shorten it because we use it so frequently. But if you notice, this is something that only happens when we use I am going to as an idea for the future. So going to meaning will. So I am, I am going to eat tomorrow. I'm gonna eat tomorrow. I'm gonna eat tomorrow. It's only when it has that idea of will, that idea of future, that you can do that. You can't say, I'm gonna the beach tomorrow. You can say, I'm gonna go to the beach tomorrow. But when go is the main verb, it can't be shortened like this. It's only when it's being used in grammatical ways. And this has happened for other things like our present day will as well. So in Old English, willin was a full verb that meant to want or to wish. By Middle English, it was sort of just expressing this future idea without a specific sense of intention. And now we shorten it into a contraction where it's just an ol sound, and we know that that means the future tense. So I can say, I'll eat later, and it's just that ol sound. And we know that means will, we know that means future, but it's just one single sound. Other really common ways that language contact, um, that language change happens is through something like language contact. So as we come in contact with other languages, the grammar, the sounds, the meanings of languages can affect each other as they spend more and more time in contact with each other. So unlike things like biological species, language change isn't always just linear. It's not just branching from a mother tongue into a daughter tongue, something we'll talk more about in the next lecture. But we do have interactions where we borrow words, we borrow constructions, we sometimes even borrow sounds that can make languages that are not actually related to each other historically seem more similar to each other over time. And one of the most common ways that we do this is through borrowing. So when we encounter new cultures with new ideas, with artifacts, with animals, with food, there are new words, there are new things that need to become part of the language. And there are some cultures that tend to resist borrowing. They don't like to borrow words. And so they tend to place a high value on native words over foreign words, languages like Ojibwe, Icelandic, to some extent French, even though they do borrow things more than they admit. Um, and so there's ways that they'll end up using words that already exist in their culture in order to create new words in, as concepts come in. In English, we borrow words all the time. We borrow words from all the languages that we encounter. We're constantly taking words and borrowing them into our language. We love to borrow. And we've borrowed from many different sources. So we've borrowed words from Ojibwe, things like moose and pecan and chipmunk and hickory. We've borrowed words from Hindi, so bazaar, khaki, yoga. We borrowed words from Hawaiian, things like hula, ukulele, taboo. Taboo is probably one that you didn't really think of as being a Hawaiian word in origin. So we borrow these words from other languages very commonly. 
And one way you can tell if a word has been fully borrowed into the language is based on the sound system that it has. <clears throat> so these are called phonotactics. These are sort of rules and restrictions of the kinds of sounds, the kinds of syllables that are allowed in different languages. So when a word is wholly borrowed, most of the time it's going to conform to that language's restrictions for how sound change takes place and how sounds are allowed to exist in certain things. So for instance, in Japanese, they tend to only allow consonant and vowel syllables. So you have consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel. They also don't distinguish as phonemes between L and R sounds. Those are allophones in Japanese. So in, the, in borrowing the word purple from English, it ends up being pronounced papuru because it has to have a consonant and a vowel every time. We can't have that R and the P next to each other in the same way. And so they get rid of that R sound in the beginning, and then that L becomes an R because it fits with the requirements and the sound changes that are part of the Japanese language. Sometimes when this happens frequently, we can even borrow sounds into a language, um, even if we would normally not have those sounds present. And so this happens sometimes for various social reasons. It sometimes happens when things are no longer allophones and they become phonemes. One famous example comes from Bantu languages. So clicks natively only occur in Khoisan languages, um, which are near Bantu languages in Southern Africa but they're not native to Bantu languages that often frequent them. So Zulu and Xhosa have clicks, but they mostly occur in borrowed words and they are things that have sort of become part of the language because of borrowing those words in. So there were a lot of words that had sort of become taboo. They couldn't use these words any longer for various historical reasons. And some of them were very common words that they needed to have words for. So since they couldn't use these taboo forms of the words, they borrowed in languages with clicks because the clicks didn't have a taboo association. And now those languages have clicks in them natively. Even today, some of that is changing as well. There's certain um, click sounds, uh, the ng sounds um, that have a sort of nasalized alveolar click. Um, in Zulu, some of those can actually be seen as sort of like our four letter words in English, where they tend to still have a sort of negative connotation with those kinds of words. In English, some of this has happened as well. So in English, we used to only have voiced fricatives as allophones of our voiceless ones. They only occurred between vowels. So an F sound was part of our language, but a V sound would only show up if it was between vowels. An S sound was part of our language. A Z sound would only occur in between vowels. But we had so many years of contact with French that over time, because we had borrowed so many words in French that had things like a V sound or a Z sound in different places, there was no longer an allophone distinction that could be made. So these became phonemes in English. They became their own separate sounds in the language as a result of this long-term contact. And we'll talk a little bit about some of that context. So English has had a lot of contact with Romance languages over time. So even though English is a Germanic language, our grammatical structure reflects this, our most common words reflect this. England was part of the Roman Empire around 100 AD. And so as English was starting, we were started, we were borrowing some Latin words during this time. And the most important and the most influential was during the Norman conquest. So in 1066 AD, France took over England and French words and grammar had a heavy influence over English because the French ruled over English England for several several hundred years. And so we got a lot of our words, our loan words, coming from French during this period of time. And then also, even later than that, in the 1700s, there were medical and mathematical terms that were largely borrowed from Latin. We had some Greek words that we were borrowing as well. And so there were lots of different periods of time where we had contact with Romance languages that forced us into adapting our language as a result. And one of the biggest effects of this, and the Norman conquest especially, was that during this time there was what's known as diglossia in England. So French and English were both spoken, but they weren't spoken in the same situations and at the same times. So different than code switching, which we talked about in the last unit, diglossia is when there's different languages spoken in different social settings, but there's not really any overlap between those settings. So for example, during this time, the French speakers were typically upper class people. They were the rulers, they were the nobility. And then the English people were usually the people that were working the land. They were the ones that were lower class and that didn't have as much social power. And so the upper class people could afford to eat meat, while the English speakers were the ones that took care of the animals while they were still alive. So if you've ever wondered why our terms for meat that we eat are different than the terms for our animals, it comes from this period of time because the words for French animals, beef, mouton, poulet, pork, 
are different than our English words for things like ox, sheep, chicken, pig, but it's because the French were referring to these animals as they were eating them. English was referring to them as they were alive. And so our terms for meat in English were taken from those French forms because the French were only using them to refer to things as they were eating them after they had already been killed and processed. So this is something that still remains today. So we have the word beef as something that is still there. We have the word poultry, we have the word pork to refer to the kinds of things we're eating specifically because of this diglossic situation. There's still also a few other present day phases, phrases that exist from this time because really one of the only times that English and French would intermingle was in governmental and law kinds of situations where there were people that spoke French and people that spoke English that were in the same room together for various reasons. And so this is where we get some of our phrases like aid and abet or cease and desist or part and parcel where both of the words in that phrase mean exactly the same thing but one has an English origin and one has a French origin. So that's why we end up having these different kinds of phrases, because they would say both of the terms so that regardless of which language you spoke in the, in the courtroom, you still understood what was going on and what was being said. So that gives an idea of some of the different contact that can happen. And one other very important area of contact, and the last one that we'll talk about in this lecture, are pigeons and creoles. So pigeons and creoles are different languages that also arise from language contact between speakers who don't initially share a common language. And there's some similarities and some differences between them as well. So pigeons are things, um, are language forms that don't have any native speakers. So they typically only arise from contact and from a very rudimentary need to communicate. So they typically have a very specific range of functions, things like trade and commerce. So if you're encountering a different group of people, you don't speak the language, you're trying to trade, you're trying to barter, you need to have some sort of way to talk. So these are typically limited in vocabulary. They have very simplified grammar. You can kind of think of if you hear some people try to talk to people that don't speak English very well, the sort of way that they break things down into simpler things. Pigeons sort of arise out of a similar kind of thing. And they have a few main characteristics. So they're used in very restricted domains and functions. They have a very simplified structure compared to the languages that they were starting from. And also they generally have a very low prestige. They're not seen in a very positive light because they're not seen as real languages. And this is often true of Creoles as well, even though Creoles have a much different um, atmosphere around them. So Creoles, by contrast, do have native speakers. Historically and in earlier times in linguistics, even just within the last couple of decades, they were argued to have developed from pigeons that then gain native speakers and then the language sort of increases in complexity once they gain native speakers. Um, but because of the way that creoles are formed, typically these are a result of colonization and long-term contact. Most people that study creoles now don't agree with this idea that they come from pigeons. The general consensus is now that Creoles are more recently seen to be languages in their own right, that they come from this long-term contact of language influence. They're not developed from a pigeon because the reasons why a creole develops are very different than the reasons why a pigeon develops. So colonization is a very long-term engagement and contact over time. And so we see that that long-term contact creates that new language out of the influence of e the languages on each other over that very long period of time. So native speakers are coming from that long-term contact, not from something that started as a pigeon and then became a creole. But the difference between native speakers is one of those main distinctions between pigeons and creoles. And in many respects, if we think about modern English in these terms, English is actually much more like a creolized language than even some of the things that we think of as creoles today. So Haitian Creole, which um, combines Haitian languages with French, um, has a lot of these concepts of creolization, but English itself also has a lot of these concepts from the time that French was involved with English. And one of the ways we can see this is in thinking about what the relationship between these languages are. So there are concepts of superstrate and substrate. These are very um, colonized terms, and so they're not usually enjoyed so much, but there haven't really been any good terms that have replaced them yet. But in language contact, when two languages come together, typically one has more prestige or dominance than another. So typically there's a colonizing language and then there's a language that was already present during that colonizing experience. And the prestige language, the dominant language, the colonizing language would be known as the super straight language. The non-prestige language would be known as the substrate language. And in general, what it contributes is really important. So dominant languages tend to contribute lexical items, words, while the substrate languages tend to maintain and contribute grammar. 
So we can see from Middle English to Modern English that a lot of our words are French in origin because of this period of time, but our grammatical influences are still Germanic in nature. So we can see that as an example of a creolization. This is also why a lot of English-influenced Creoles sound a little bit familiar to us as English speakers. So Hawaiian pidgin, for instance, which is actually a Creole, kind of sounds familiar sometimes because it has an English uh, super straight form. A lot of other English-influenced Creoles have ways that we can kind of understand what's happening because those lexical items are being provided by English and then the grammatical items are being provided by the other contact languages. So as a quick example, Nicaraguan Creole English, if I give you the sentence, Digiao give one rose to Amada, if you look at that and you think about it for a while, you can probably figure out that this is the girl gave a rose to her mother. Or mi head de hot me is my head hurts. Or me in a town, I'm in town. Lea shoved Maria in the hole. Lea pushed Maria into a hole. Mary see herself in the looking glass. Mary saw herself in the mirror. And what you'll notice is that there is still some simplification of grammar aspects. So there's not as much difference in tense as you might see. So things that are in past tense don't look like they're in past tense. There's still some simplification of sounds where they're not using as many sounds. Several Creoles don't really use R sounds because they tend to be a little bit more difficult to pronounce. Others like this Nicaraguan one does. <clears throat> but it shows you that there's still fewer tenses, there tends to be fewer sounds um, in these languages because of the long-term contact and that simplification that can take place. To give an idea of where you see these different pigeons and creoles, you may notice the map is a little hard to see um, on the screen, but the areas where you're seeing those different numbers, you'll notice that they're mostly in heavily colonized areas, things like the Caribbean and Central Africa, parts of the Pacific in some areas. And then the ones that you see that are outliers are mostly pigeons. So something like Chinook jargon, which was from British Columbia, isn't really used anymore because there's no longer a need to use it as a trade language now that there are people that speak the same language with each other in those regions. Others like Haitian Creole or Hawaiian pigeon, which is actually a Creole, are actually spoken by, the, by many people as a first language or sometimes an only language. So about 90 to 95% of Haitians speak Haitian Creole as a first language even though it's not the official language, even though it's not the dominant language in the country, it is actually the most common language in the country. So as always, if there are any questions that you have, email me, schedule some office hours, bring them to class, and we'll talk about them together. And then the next lecture, we'll look at some other aspects of historical linguistics. So thank you.